So the Bill of Rights Institute, the Bill of Rights. First one, I think, is the most important, and I really love it in that it says, Congress shall pass no law. I just stop there. And we don't hear that enough, especially here in Washington, because they think they're not doing their job unless they're passing a law and probably violating the Constitution. But that's a beautiful concept. The founders had a good idea when they said there was a reason to restrict the power of the people in this town. Congress shall pass no law. Free speech against speech is, of course, the First Amendment. Uh, Juan has had his own experience there. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, at Fox, I work now for Fox. If they don't like what I say, First Amendment doesn't apply to them. They can fire me. I mean, they respect free speech at Fox, but they could fire me, and that's okay with me because the Bill of Rights applies only to government for good reason. There's lots of TV stations around, but there's only one government. Juan has his problem with the idiots at NPR. <laughs> I don't know what they are. Are they government? Are they private? I mean, they only get a little of their money from the government. They could be private, then they could say whatever silly rules they want. But they are national public radio, so, and they get money from you, so they're government. So the Constitution should apply to them. And we, we take the First Amendment for granted in this country. I mean, we don't, Canada, we think of America-like, but in Canada, when a magazine published those Danish cartoons that depicted Mohammed in unflattering ways after September 11th, those cartoons caused riots in the Middle East, when a Canadian magazine published some of those cartoons, they got prosecuted by Canadian authorities for perpetuating a hate crime against Muslims. We shouldn't take our First Amendment for granted. We have it in the United States. Most countries don't have a right to free speech. But it's important, and as I look through some of these essays that have submitted, one caught my eye from A.D. Steinbach of St. Louis. She wrote an essay about dissent Dissent, she wrote, or exercising the right to freedom of speech is the most essential value to being an American. And, you know, we could argue about that, and there are a lot of essays you wrote that might be a more essential value. I, I won't quarrel with it, but it's certainly one of them. And she goes on to say, citizens should not only have a right, but an obligation to speak out against tyrannical in tyrannical government. And that, of course, is what our founders did. And that, of course, is what is our job if our government gets to be tyrannical. And we who believe in freedom are often fond of complaining about the intrusions on freedom. I mean, they pass 80,000 pages of new rules every year because the regulators in this town think they're not doing their job if they're not passing a new rule. And all that eats into our freedom. It's a spider web of little laws that take away our freedom, all well intended, though they don't accomplish the goals. But by and large, we have become more free in this country. It's easy to say we're less free in terms of taxes or if you're trying to start a business. But if you're a woman, if you're black or if you're gay, you are much more free than you were when I was a kid. People forget, women used to have to get their husband's permission to get a credit card. The story of black America is well known. I mean, look how much freer gays are. I mean, we have become a much freer, more tolerant society in so many ways because people can speak out against what they consider to be tyranny. And what I would like to speak out against, and what I do in my job, what I view is tyrannical, is the size of the state in America. Because as it grows, it makes us less free. The more money, government creates no jobs, government doesn't create any money, so everything they do more of, we have less of. 
and the current administration and the Bush administration before it talked a lot about investment and they spent a ton on investment in great things. And it is intuitive, if you don't really understand economics, to believe that the wise central planners and state capitals in Washington, D.C. can invest better, that maybe we do need high-speed rail, or we need Sputnik uh, retaliation, or we need government to plan it rather than the free market. But we should have learned from the Soviet Union it doesn't work very well. I mean, again and again. I, I argue about education. I hope your schools are good. K through 12 education in America is lousy according to the international tests. We get our clocks cleaned by people in other countries that spend half as much in education as, as we do. And I say it's because you don't have a free market. Free market is what brings us all the good stuff that makes our life better. And education, K through 12, is largely a government monopoly. And they don't do things very well. And people say to me, well, wait, you got to have government running education because it's not like cars or computers or cell phones because the customer doesn't know what's best. You don't know about curriculum. And people say the same thing about health care. The health care customer can't make his own decision about whether he has cancer or not, so the market doesn't apply. And intuitively, that makes sense. But 40 years of reporting have taught me that the market does everything better. And as an example, take cars. I mean, you can equally say none of you, I assume, understand what makes one car run better than another or safer than another. I mean, it's just you need central planners to design the cars. And yet, look what happened when you had central planners designing the cars. I mean, what was the best that the planned economies could produce? It was the Tremont. Yeah. Is the slide up? Okay, it's over there. Um, that was the bad, that and the Yugo, that was the best they could do. It was such a bad car that you had to put the oil and gas in separately and shake the car to mix them together. <laughs> and yet this was the pride of the Eastern Bloc and it was made by those East German engineers, no slouches. So why, this doesn't make sense. This, East German engineers, how come they're best? I mean, the uh, Trabant disappeared as soon as the Berlin Wall went down. Why couldn't their best compete with our mediocre product? Because not everybody has to be an expert for the free market to work its magic. You just need word of mouth. The good news spread. If you, people like the car, they talk about it. The good companies thrive, the bad ones atrophy. That protects the poor, too. But this vision is not what our governing classes have embraced, this idea of limited government that the founders talked about. And you can see it in the growth of government. I mean, here it is since the beginning of the country. Is it? I can't see this. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, here it is adjusted for population growth. I mean, for most of the history of America, government was less than 5% of GDP. It's only since Lyndon Johnson and the promises of the Great Society that the line starts to go straight up. And now we've all heard about how we're on an unsustainable course. And yet, until recently, they haven't been embarrassed by this. They just keep subsidizing more things. Everybody needs help. Government can help. And that's intuitive. And here in Washington, if you're a congressman, you hear people testify before you, and 99% of the people testifying are people saying, you have to help us, we're in need, and look at the great things we've done with this program. It's very hard to say no to that. But the result of that is that they even subsidize foolish rich people like me. <laughs> this is a house I built. Did it click? Did it? Workplace, oh, okay, well, let's talk about that. I, I goofed. <laughs> Another example of the conceit of the self-anointed in government. They say that Americans are safer now because of, the of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Authority. And the head of OSHA under President Clinton was fond of showing this chart about how injuries and deaths, I guess this chart is deaths. Boy, I wish I could see it. Um, <laughs> have dropped steadily since the beginning of OSHA. And this makes you think, 
right. I mean, these factories, these greedy employers would recklessly kill their employers if it weren't for government stopping them. And look how many lives we've saved because of OSHA. And I can do stories about how OSHA has silly rules that are this thick that torture companies and cause some companies not even to go into business because they can't afford to hire the lawyers to understand the rules that say the railing has to be exactly this high and you can get fined if you don't have, if it's an inch lower. Uh, but you won't believe me because you say, look at that chart, look how many lives we've saved. But then researchers went back and did another chart that looked at workplace deaths from that time and also an equal time before. And look what they found. Things were getting better anyway. In a free country, life gets better. People get smarter. As people get richer, they care more about health and safety. Even unions help. They have their work roles. And even the worst of the greediest employer is doesn't want to kill his employees, if only because he'll have to spend more to train new ones. <laughs> he has a self-interest in making the workplace better. But the point is that workplaces were getting better before OSHA. OSHA, if you look at that graph, the slope of the line is the same. OSHA made no difference. The government regulators are like someone who gets in front of a parade and claims to lead the parade. But they didn't lead the parade. Limited government freedom. An open society led the parade. And then going back to the other point, and, and yet the sense in Washington is that we have to do everything. We have to make sure nobody suffers, that people buy the insurance. That's the big thing with health care. It also applied to flood insurance. Homes were getting flooded, and people were too lazy or too stupid to buy flood insurance. Uh, then the government felt, well, we have to bail all of them out. Far better if we encourage them to buy insurance, but it costs too much. Those greedy private insurance companies, they're charging too much, so we're gonna offer federal flood insurance, and we know how to price it. We'll price it lower than these greedy private companies, and that'll help America. And so they offered people cheap federal flood insurance, and so I built this beach house. <laughs> I said to my father, would you help me on the mortgage? And he said, no, are you kidding? It's on the edge of an ocean. Why would I help you? This is a stupid place to build a house. It's on sand. That's me in the upper left corner there. I was younger then. And I said, but, but Dad, I can't lose. The architect explained to me there's this thing called federal flood insurance for $200 a year. I'm guaranteed that if the house and it won't wash away, I have lots of beach in front of me, that big dune, if it does wash away, that they'll cover me. And so he did help me out, and I built the house. And sure enough, eight years later, the water came in and washed away the first floor. And I have to thank you, because I never invited you there. <laughs> but you helped me pay to <laughs> replace that first floor. And eventually, the whole house went, and you again paid. I mean. When you look at that growth of government chart and you think about some of that money is going to subsidize people like me building houses on the edge of an ocean, the role of government has gone well beyond the Constitution. And I mean, think about it. This is, this is the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence together. It's this thin. These were the rules that the founders set. And now we get 80,000 pages added to the Federal Register every year. I mean, this is what built America. The 80,000 pages don't help this, but they keep growing up. Now, the same student, A.D. Steinbach, who I cited, she goes on to say, now my generation's been labeled as apathetic and self-absorbed. And when I was your age, I viewed that as a problem. I no longer do. I, I now think that's a good thing. Because most of your friends don't know anything. And I'm OK if they don't vote. Because I didn't know anything. I mean, I was older than you. I went to Princeton, where supposedly I learned a lot. And when I graduated, I didn't know anything. I was taught that government could solve poverty and make the world better. Had I bothered to vote then, had I been political instead of looking to meet girls, 
I, I would have been destructive to America. So I think some apathy is a good thing. And there, there is a saying that 1% that of the people in America, some of you, most of you, make things happen. And 9% of America watches those people make things happen. Those are the people watching CNN and Fox. And then 90% of America uh, wake up in the morning and they say, what happened? <laughs> And I don't think that's a problem. I think that's a sign of a good country, that you have lives. And you know, in, in horrible countries, everybody votes because your life's at stake. It's good to live in a country where, you, where things are going pretty well and you can be apathetic. And apathy can be a good thing because why is America, of all these countries in the world, and six billion people on Earth, and most of them live in horrible poverty that you would find awful. Two billion of them live on a buck or two a day. The uh, people living on the western levels of wealth are maybe 12% of the world. So why is that? How come America thrives when most of the world struggles? And we're a new country? How come we got rich? And I say this to high school kids, and they say, well, it's because America's a democracy. And we were a new country. We have a lot of natural resources. And that's true. And democracy's great. Um, but India is a democracy, too. And India's been poor. It has lots of natural resources. And the high school students say, well, India's overpopulated. And that's the image, and that's been blamed for poverty in India. Um, but it's not true. The population density of India is the same as that of New Jersey. And New Jersey's doing OK. <laughs> All right, some of you don't agree with that, but <laughs> it's doing better than India. It's not about population <laughs> density. Holland has even greater population density. And then look at. Look at Hong Kong. Hong Kong doesn't even have democracy. They had the British rulers and the communist Chinese. They don't have any natural resources. They're just a rock. And yet Hong Kong went from third world desperate poverty to our level of wealth, which they have now, in just 50 years. They have the secret to prosperity. Wouldn't the whole world benefit from that? What did Hong Kong have? No natural resources, no democracy, but they had economic freedom because the British rulers enforced rule of law. That's important. You need rule of law. You need someone to make sure that I don't kill you or take your stuff. Same rule you learn in kindergarten. Don't hurt other people or take their stuff. And the worst places to live are the places that don't have rule of law, the African country where you're afraid to open a factory to build something because maybe your neighbor will steal what you make or the dictator will take your whole factory. So you need rule of law. But then after that, the British rulers basically sat around and drank tea. <laughs> they left the people of Hong Kong alone. And free people left alone with rule of law and right to contract, they made themselves rich. That's what economic freedom does. There are these rankings of countries by economic freedom, and the places that have more prosper, and they're nice places to live. New Zealand, Australia, Switzerland, Canada, the United States. Places with less economic freedom are awful places to live, like Cuba and Zimbabwe. Economic freedom works. I mean, the, one of the other essays I read by I'm going to mess up your name, Shashnat Chu from Edison, New Jersey. He wrote about industry. Economic freedom allows industry to happen, which is what allows us to make our lives better. This is capitalism that we take for granted in America. And in many colleges you'll go to, they will vilify it as unfair, evil, and yet, we shouldn't because it does wonderful things. And we take it for granted. We go to the supermarket and there are 30,000 products. And they are under unbelievably cheap. And they almost never poison you. <laughs> Government management can't do that. We take it for granted that we can go to a foreign country, stick a piece of plastic in the wall, and cash will come out. 
And you can take that same piece of plastic and hand it to a total stranger who doesn't even speak English, and he'll rent you a car for a week. <laughs> and when you get home, Visa or MasterCard will have the accounting correct to the penny. And we just accept that. But it's a miracle of free markets and capitalism and limited government. I mean, government can't even count the votes correctly. <laughs> and now we want government to run health care? I don't think that's a good idea. The Bill of Rights and the Constitution laid it out for us if we would just listen. Limited government, economic freedom, lift people up. And I thank you for fighting for these principles that made our lives good. Thank you very much. So I'm told that there are two people for questions or criticisms or vicious attacks, whatever you like. There are two people with microphones who will go around. And if you want to say something, um, find the, you have a microphone there, OK? And sh somebody over there has a microphone. So I can't see you because there are lights in my face. So I would say let's go from <laughs> ping and pong side of the room, whoever wants to say something. Ah, oh, that's better. Now I can see. And why don't you say, you're the guy from Oregon, right? I Hillsboro, am. Oregon, right? Correct. Hey, how about remembering that? <laughs> I, used to, I used to live near there, so that's why I know that. What do you believe is the most significant threat to American liberty? And how, as American citizens, do you believe that, or how, as American citizens, can we oppose this threat? I think the biggest threat to liberty is the growth of government. And Thomas Jefferson said it well. It's, it's the natural progress of things for government to grow and liberty to yield. And it is just natural because it's intuitive to think you could solve problems by passing more laws. And it really takes an education to wake people up to that. The Tea Party movement was pushed to the point where they started thinking about it. I don't think they really get it. The reason I have the Stossel in the Classroom charity is to, is to buy my old specials on free markets from ABC and now Fox, which gives them to me. They don't sell them to me, thankfully. Um, and to get them in the classrooms to at least show people that there is an alternative to government control because it's not intuitive. Somebody over here? Hi, John. Uh, my name is Dustin Lechner, teacher from Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, good to meet you. Um, you compare American education to some of these other countries that are uh, leaps and bounds ahead of us in test numbers and things of that nature. Um, are any of these countries based on a free market educational system? Um, to my knowledge, most of them are more socialistic than the United States in their education systems. Um, so I guess. And what, what do you mean by more socialistic than the U.S.? Uh, take Germany, for instance, um, totally state-funded. Uh, their higher education system, their college system, is costs them four or five hundred dollars a year to go to college. Um, obviously, they have a different system than we do. Um, their college preparatory program uh, caters to a smaller number of students than ours does. So my, my question is, uh, what is the answer, in your opinion? Is it a free market system? Is it a revamping of uh, the public system that we have? Um, and what countries might we model that are ahead of us? Uh, I, I think we should model the countries that are at the top of the list. Like, uh, I mean, it's true. I mean, Singapore, Hong Kong, they, they have a culture that's different from ours. But Finland, Belgium, I mean, for this show I did called Stupid in America, we had gave the same kids in Belgium the test that we gave the kids in New Jersey uh, at a top school, and the kids in Belgium destroyed the New Jersey kids. Uh, and I asked the Belgium testers, and I also asked the people who ran the international tests, what, what's a predictor of what countries do well? And before I give the answer to that, I want to just address something in your point, in that Germany, you talked about the college system. 
I've been talking about K through 12 education. And in America, too, it's just to socialize all the money comes from the government. I mean, whether you have vouchers or whether you just have government monopoly education, it's all coming from the government. In America, the colleges are not government funded largely. They are largely private. You had a voucher system that helped build the colleges, the GI Bill that came after World War II. And American colleges are not behind the rest of the world. People in the rest of the world want to come to American colleges because there's some competition. There's a voucher system. And they got good because they had to compete for the best students. It's K through 12, the government monopoly. It's just as social, more socialized in America as any place in the world that's the problem. And the people who ran the international test said the biggest predictor of success are two things. Does the school have autonomy? Can they, are they free to try stuff rather than being rule bound? And second and most important is the money attached to the kid. In Belgium, the parent could take the money and in America, it's these days 11th hour per student. So do the math, a class of 25 kids is almost 300,000 per classroom, not including capital costs, just operating costs. Think what you could do, how many good teachers you could hire for 250,000 per classroom. I don't know where the money goes. It's a government monopoly. They make money disappear. It's, they create the turbant, that car. That's the, that's the American school system. But in the countries where the money's attached to the kid and they can take it to a Catholic school, a private school, a uh, secular school, a government school, and there's choice and they have to compete and the principal says, gee, we can't have, afford to have this Deadwood teachers here because the parents complain. Well, imagine that. That's how the rest of the world works and you compete in business. If you offer a lousy product, people go away and you're out of business. But in America, a government monopoly school system, we've forbidden that. You can't fire the bad teachers, and the money doesn't go with the kids. If the money went with the kids, the best teachers would be making 200000 a year, teaching big classes, and kids would learn more. But yes, the free market, competition, I would argue that's the answer. I'm sorry to give such a long answer. I'll be quicker now from the rest of these. OK, this will be our last question. Um, uh, I'm Mike there from uh, California. You said the uh, greatest threat was uh, the growth of government. What do you think is the best way to limit the growth of government to return back to the ideals of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? To vote the big spenders out. And it's my only hope. It'll always be an uphill climb. And did she say that was the last question? Yep, okay, so thank you and good night.